Okay, honor students, we're talking through photosynthesis, which is concept four notes. So, we kind of been talking about all organisms need a constant supply of energy to survive. And for most life on Earth, the ultimate source of energy is the sun. Remember, a very small amount of producers can do chemosynthesis and make energy, or excuse me, make food sources from chemicals, but pretty much all their producers are using photosynthesis. So, Photosynthesis is where we're going to be converting energy from the sun into something that's actually usable. Remember, usable for you as a human is ATP. Photosynthesis, we're just taking it from the sun to glucose. And then in concept five, we'll talk about how we take it from glucose to ATP. Um, so one step at a time, but first kind of this first step in that process of making it usable for you. So photosynthesis is the overall process by which sunlight or solar energy or light energy chemically converts water and carbon dioxide into chemical energy stored in glucose, which is a sugar or carbohydrate. Now, if you look at this picture, I love it. Light energy comes into the plant. It also takes in carbon dioxide in its stomata and water in its roots, and then it's going to make sugars, and it's going to release oxygen, but that's just a byproduct. So photosynthesis isn't designed to make oxygen for you to breathe. It's designed to make sugars, but oxygen just happens to be released also, which is a very nice perk. Water gets absorbed in the roots, CO2 is absorbed through the stomata in the plant leaves, and it's re this process is represented by the following chemical equation, which you've seen in concept one. We talked about key biochemical reactions, but now you need to memorize. So let's talk about it in more detail. So remember, reactants are ingredients. The reactants in photosynthesis are the carbon dioxides in the waters. The products are the results, and that's glucose and oxygen. Um, now, solar energy from the sun is necessary. Photosynthesis can't happen without it. And also some enzymes, too, that make the process go down. But it, they're not considered reactants or products, which is why we write solar energy above the arrow instead of to the left or the right of it. So make sure you make note of that. But it is important you include it when you're writing the chemical equation out, which you'll definitely have to do on some assessments. All right, so photosynthesis, we know from our cells unit, is going down in the chloroplast. But we didn't talk much about the chloroplast. And it has two different parts to it, and the two steps in photosynthesis happen in each of the two parts, so we need to know them. First is the grana. That's like the pancake-like stacks of thylakoid membrane. So grana is like this big old stack of pancakes, and thylakoid is like an individual pancake. So that's one part of the chloroplast. The other part is the fluid-like part, which is called the stroma. And that's just the fluid that spill, like spill, <laughs> sorry, tongue-tied, that fills the space between the grana. So then we got pancakes and we got syrup. Okay, that's the two parts. Our right, little side note, I'm going to throw in a few of these as we go just to give you some real world context. Why are plants green? Well, this is important and this has to do with the chloroplast. So that's why it's not completely random. The plants are green because of the presence of a pigment called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and some other pigments called carotenoids absorb every color of light in sunlight except for green. And if you remember from physical science, whatever's not absorbed gets reflected. So green is what's being reflected, and therefore that's what we're seeing. Now chlorophyll is really important. Chlorophyll is the pigment that allows plants to absorb sunlight. Because we don't have chlorophyll, we cannot do photosynthesis, which is why we're consumers and not producers. So it's a really important pigment. All right, so like I mentioned, there's two stages in photosynthesis. The light-dependent reaction, which is kind of the photo part of photosynthesis, because photo means light. It requires solar energy, which is why it's dependent on light. It's also known as the electron transport chain, or the ETC, or you may see it in an old textbook referred to as a light reaction. So, not going to overcomplicate this at all, right? You got three different names talking about the same thing. The second step is the light independent reaction, which is the synthesis part of photosynthesis, because when we're actually going to synthesize glucose, is in this step. It does not require any solar energy because it's independent of light. And it's also known as the Calvin cycle, or in really old textbooks, it's going to be referred to as the dark reaction. All right, so we're going to talk through each of these in broad scope and then in detail. So first is the light-dependent reaction. I remember that it happens first because D becomes before I in the alphabet. The big picture purpose of this step is to capture energy from the sun. 
and store it in energy carrying molecules, which are ATP and NADPH. So ATP and NADPH carry energy and they're gonna power the second step, the light independent step. And this is necessary because this step can be powered by sunlight, but the second step can't because it happens without sunlight. So that's why we have to charge these up in order to power the next step. This happens in the grana. Specifically, it's happening in the thylakoid membrane because that's where chlorophyll is. So it's happening in the pancakes. And remember, it happens in the pancakes because you always put pancakes on your plate before you put syrup. So you put your pancakes and you pour the syrup on top. So the first step's in the pancakes and the second step is in the syrupy part. All right, so summary, and then we'll get to details. Basically, what happens is water, which is one of the reactants, gets split into hydrogen and oxygen. And then oxygen is released as like a byproduct or a waste product. And then ATP and NADPH get charged up by the sun or by the solar energy from the sun that's absorbed, and then they'll go on and power the next step. Okay, and now here's a very complicated picture of what's going on. I'm not going to make you know it to this detail, but I am going to make you know more detail, which we're going to talk about on the next slide. So here's kind of the details. That's the big picture. If you're just trying to survive this unit, this is the bare minimum you memorize. Now, you won't do great on the test, but you will hopefully pass it if you at least know these basics. All right, but here's what you really need to know is the details. So energy from the sun gets absorbed, and it gets passed down this electron transport chain. And then at the end, it's stored in the bonds of ATP and NADPH. So what's happening is light energy from the sun excites a bunch of electrons, and they start moving crazily. Remember, we learned in physical science, electrons move like balls bouncing down stairs. So they're moving crazy. These crazy E go down the ETC. And think of the ETC, the electron transport chain, like a slide. So you got all these balls, all these electrons just bouncing crazily down this slide. And then at the end of this slide, they combine with these final electron acceptors or car carriers. So NADP plus and ADP are at the bottom, and they catch these electrons, and when they catch that energy, they become NADPH and ATP, okay? Which can go on to power the next step. This is a chemiosmotic process or chemiosmotic process because it's using a concentration gradient so these hydrogen ions these electrons are moving down the gradient and that's what's charging up the ATP we mentioned chemiosmotic process when we talked about how ATP is formed which was in concept two so at the end of this ETC that ATP and NADPH we just charged up by those excited electrons and hydrogens leave the grana they leave the pancakes and they go into the syrup or the stroma for the next stage it's going to happen independent of sunlight. So how is light absorbed? Photosystems are what are actually absorbing the light. They're basically just clusters of chlorophyll and proteins that trap energy from the sun. And remember chlorophyll is a pigment that can absorb sunlight. We don't have it. That's why we can't do this. And then that energy gets transferred to electrons which makes excited electrons which love to bounce down the ETC. So that's basically what's going down. There's sort of some one and two and all these other details that you don't need to know. You do need to know the details from this previous slide and this one. All right, we mentioned electron carriers. I want to talk about those a little bit more. These are just molecules that carry electrons in order to pass on the energy that the electrons have. So an example, NADP plus is a compound that can accept a pair of high energy electrons and then it can transfer them to another molecule. So NADP plus is going to grab two electrons and a hydrogen, and it's going to become NADPH. Whereas ADP grabs energy, and it grabs a phosphate to become ATP. So ATP and NADPH, think of those as like full gas tanks that are all charged up and ready to go. Whereas NADP plus and ADP are empty gas tanks. So once they're charged up, they're ready to carry energy from the light-dependent reaction into the light-independent reaction to power it. Again, you're like, this detail sucks so much worse than what the CP class has to know. I know, but I'm still making you learn way less than there actually is to know, like you can see in this picture. All right, we're halfway there. Light independent reaction. The purpose of this is to now use the energy in those energy carrying molecules, ATP and NADPH, that were from the light dependent reaction, and we're going to actually make the sugar, which was the original goal, in this step. And this happens in the stroma or the syrupy part of the chloroplast. Summary, 
of the Calvin cycle is it's basically a bunch of enzyme-assisted chemical reactions that are basically going down. And they're, it's all being powered by ATP and NADPH. And it basically produces three carbon sugars from carbon dioxide and um, the hydrogens from water, um, which will then, it'll and it'll happen twice. And then these three carbon sugars eventually combine to make glucose, which is a six carbon sugar. C6 takes six carbons. So it's basically this cycle, and it happens twice, and a bunch of enzymes power it. Now, we're going to go through some details. We're going to split it up into four sections of what's happening. So first is the grabbing. So one CO2 is going to diffuse into the stroma. Enzymes take that CO2, and they attach it to a 5-carbon so 5C means 5-carbon RUBP molecule. RUBP stands for rubulose biphosphate. It's really hard to say. I probably just butchered it too. But that one carbon dioxide combines with a 5-carbon. Now we have a 6-carbon molecule. So it makes this really unstable 6-carbon molecule. Then that 6-carbon molecule is going to split because it's super unstable, so it doesn't want to stay that way. So energy from ATP and NADPH in an enzyme are what allow this 6-carbon molecule to split into two 3-carbon molecules called PGA, which is phosphoglycerides, which, again, I may have just butchered that name also. So PGA, though, splitting it into two PGAs. All right, leaving. Each of those 3-carbon molecules, those PGAs, gets converted into a different 3-carbon molecule called G3P. One of those G3Ps leaves the cycle and goes on to become glucose. The other G3P moves on to the next step, which is switching. And that G3P gets converted back into a 5-carbon RUBP and by using a phosphate from the ATP, and it starts over again. So this is going to happen twice, and the two G3Ps that leave will end up combining and becoming glucose. Not complicated at all, right? And that's pretty much what it looks like. So remember, though, not all producers do this. Some can do chemosynthesis and make their food from chemicals if they can't do photosynthesis, but the majority of producers do do this process. Now, a few more things I want to talk about, one being the rate, how quickly this can happen. It's affected by three things. First is light intensity. Um, the more intense the light, so the more sunlight there is, the more excited the electrons can be, so that'll make the um, light-dependent reaction happen faster. Also, carbon dioxide. The more carbon dioxide there is, um, the more ingredients there are to work with, so it can happen faster because there's more substrate. And then temperature. We've talked about before, um, temperature accelerates the process because temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy, so particles are moving faster because they have greater kinetic energy, so they're colliding more. Um, but only to a certain degree because we know if temperature gets too extreme, it can denature enzymes, which is not good. So think for a second, why do you think root cells in a plant don't even have chloroplasts? They don't even need them. That's because chloroplasts catch sunlight, and since roots are underground, they're not exposed to the sun, so there'd be no purpose for them to be there. So they can't even do photosynthesis. All right, sometimes there has to be an alternate option. We can't just do photosynthesis like normal. So we mentioned earlier stomata, they're on leaves, they're like pores that allow the gases in and out. So this is also where plants lose water. It's also where carbon dioxide enters and it's where oxygen exits. So it's like basically where plants sweat, CO2 enters and O2 exits. If it's too hot or dry out, plants close their stomata. So they close those pores so they don't lose too much water and they don't get dehydrated. But when they close those pores, CO2 can't come in and oxygen can't exit, which is not good for doing photosynthesis. So this causes the CO2 levels to drop and the O2 levels to increase. And this creates something called photorespiration. And that basically adds oxygen to the Calvin cycle instead of carbon dioxide, which is not good. Meaning we're not making sugar and we're not having ATP, which is, again, sad face. We're wasting everything that the plant has. So in order to avoid all of this, there's two alternative pathways that some plants will do. There's the CAM pathway and the C4 pathway. So CAM is done by cacti and pineapples. And this is when they basically only open their stomata at night and they keep them closed during the day in order to retain water. 
So it's basically the opposite. Normal plants are open during the day and closed at night. So this causes them to grow really slowly because they do this, but it allows them to retain water and prevent photorespiration from happening. The other option is C4. This is done by corn and sugar cane. This is where they just partially close their stomata during the hottest part of the day, and then it's open the rest of the day. So they only need about half as much water as normally normal plants, which is awesome. And then it prevents them from de getting dehydrated and photorespiration happening also. And that is photosynthesis.